Hi, thanks for joining uh, me today. My name is Mark Deuze. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Amsterdam. And this vlog is part of a series uh, of interviews, conversations I have with academic colleagues that I'm a huge fan of, that I love, that whose work I cite and, and, and use in my teaching and research and who I've gotten the privilege to know over the course of their and, and my career. And today, my very special guest is Henry Jenkins. Henry, I guess, doesn't need an introduction for most of us. Um, he's the Provost Professor of Communication, Journalism, Cinematic Arts and Education at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles in the United States. He's the author of so many books that have benchmarked and contribute to defining the field of media studies. Uh, Textual Poachers, originally published in 1992 with a 20th anniversary edition in 2012. Um, Convergence Culture from 2006 as a landmark title that I'm suspecting we're going to get an anniversary edition of soon. Um, his latest books uh, are a series of collected interviews on participatory culture that just came out. Um, uh, an amazing book on the history and industry of comics and um, uh, two books uh, um, related to his work at the Civic Imagination Project um, in Los Angeles, uh, specifically Popular Culture and the Civic Imagination that he co-edited uh, um, with his colleagues there. And, and beyond that, we all know Henry from his countless contributions to our field in books in papers uh, his blog that has been running since 2008 he's a podcaster now for the last couple of years um, interviewing colleagues and people from the industry um, making sense of our media environment um, our conversation is about where his ideas come from um, how we can sort of trace a line throughout all of his work um, um, what role and position to assume as a public intellectual? How do we take responsibility for the fact that we study media in a media culture where everybody talks about media? And, and, and Henry offers sage advice uh, today from a hotel room in Atlanta, Georgia, where I got a chance uh, to catch up with him. Uh, personally, this interview uh, means the world to me. I've known Henry since um, uh, 2005 when I was visiting and speaking at one of his infamous media in transition conferences at MIT in, in Boston in the United States. And, and when I finally got up enough courage to walk up and say hi to somebody who was, I was a huge fan of at the time, um, uh, we had a lovely chat. And when I came back to Indiana uh, later on that week, he sent me the draft manuscript of Convergence Culture with a note. Uh, would you mind having a look at it? And I would love to hear what you think. And that's how Henry approaches the world around him, sharing, open, always helping, especially junior scholars from all over the world, uh, a mindset that I've gotten to know and respect profoundly throughout my career. Um, please enjoy, subscribe, leave comments, follow this vlog series. We've got many more to come and I always really appreciate hearing from you. But yeah, thanks again, Henry, so much for 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 being here. From uh, from what you told me, is uh, is one of the many hotel rooms you spent your yes. professional life in. Yeah, and 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 it's um um th this is I mean this is weird, right? Because yeah, you are a globe trotting academic, and and so the hotel room doesn't hold many surprises to you. But right now, none of us can really travel at all, and it's a strange situation. Yeah, this is the first trip I've taken since March. Uh, my wife left to go to Atlanta to tend to her aging mother on, as the lockdown was hitting LA. And we've been living apart since then. And I've just flown out to be there and provide a little moral support and get a little pick me up myself mm -hmm. uh, as we enter the end final weeks of the semester at, at USC. Um, Atlanta is where I grew up and where my wife spent most of her high school years, from her high school and undergraduate years. So it's a special place for us. It's not just any hotel room, but 
Mm. It's at the same time uh, a hotel room that has nothing to do with me other than that I often spend time in them. <laughs> right, right. And um, well, I mean, you spending so much time in hotel rooms is, is definitely a feature of your career now. But I, I would like for our conversation maybe to go back to you know when your career got started and specifically the publication of your 1988 essay on on on, on Star Trek, and and um, and soon to be followed by your seminal book Textual Poachers, right in in in, in 1992 that got its 20th anniversary update as well. Um, around that same time, there were a couple of other people writing about this this sort of move where we were becoming to become more respectful towards audiences and not just in the way they consume media, but where they take media and, and make it their own in all kinds of different ways. In Ang's work on watching Dallas, uh, I think is, a, is an important reference uh, for us here as well. And um, what I really appreciated among so many other things is, is how in that original article, you made this passionate plea for taking the lived experience of people in how they just use media to make it through their everyday life to take that seriously, like to, to, to start from there. And, um, and, and this, this, this notion of respecting and acknowledging people's experiences, desires, values, practices, seems so straightforward, so commonsensical now. But at that time, this was quite a, I would almost say revolutionary No, so at least it wasn't common to have that perspective uh, at the time. And, and, and you explained that lack of consideration in that article way back when as perhaps that academics were to some extent still not really comfortable with people's simple pleasures and practices. Uh, or that that people were a bit out of control and undisciplined in how they use media and make sense of that. Uh, I mean, how how do you look back at that time now? I mean, I mean, couldn't we handle people just having fun? <laughs> well, I think academics have always had trouble handling people just having fun. <laughs> uh, you know, we we tend to even when we're having fun to turn it into work and write about it. So I, you know, I think that's just part of the academic lifestyle is a certain kind of puritism, a certain kind of disavowal of the body and of pleasure and emotion. But you know, I think the or the anxiety about the audience goes somewhat deeper than that. So maybe I need to take us through a little bit of my journey getting to that point. Yeah. I had been what I now call a fan uh, in one way or another since I was in sixth, seventh grade, where I fell passionately in love with monsters and started reading famous monsters of Filmland magazine, which opened me up to thinking about older movies and media in a much more active way. And it was a space that really encouraged fan participation. Mm -hmm. It had a, a special, one special issue was just about fan ma uh, monster makeup and how to make yourself up to look like a monster. There were constant profiles of super eight filmmakers in the magazine and model makers and so forth. So it was a place that really encouraged us to think about media in relation to participation. And those were my earliest engagements with media in any serious way. So from the beginning, I saw media as something we participated in. And as I went through high school and college, I was inspired by an older cousin, uh, George, who was part of the Atlanta science fiction fantasy convention scene to start going to cons, to start paying attention to what fans were doing. So by the time I got to graduate school, my choice to go to graduate school was shaped by this kind of fan culture, by the critical and creative engagement with the media that fandom represented. And it was really during my first semester in graduate school, I heard people start to talk about media audiences and their behavior in ways that just seemed totally bizarre to me, had nothing to do with what I directly experienced. I remember asking at the end of a lecture, my first semester in grad school, about what they knew of fan fiction and you know the idea that there were people writing novels based on television shows they were in love with and did researchers look at this and was there a way to get insights and the audience behavior from it? And people looked at me like I was from Mars They'd never heard of such things. So as I went through with the encouragement of a number of teachers, but Kathy Schwichtenberg being an early one, but later John Fisk, who I studied under both at Iowa and Wisconsin, I was gradually introduced to the beginnings of 
the post-Birmingham School cultural studies interest in the audience, which in my account grows out of the work on subcultures and then expands to look at audiences. And when I came to fandom, I saw it as both a subculture and an audience, something that could be studied through the bringing together of both of those things. So it was Fisk who introduced me to the, that work on audiences, including teaching me the Ian Ng book on Dallas for the first time, or Dorothy Hobson's work on Crossroads, or John Tullock's work on Doctor Who. And there's a whole slew of key work on media audiences, Janice Radway's work on reading the romance. Mm. And then that lay a foundation out of which I began to write that first article. That first article was had its roots in something I wrote for Kathy Schwichtenberg's class my second semester in, as an MA student. Mm. It's something I rewrote as a PhD candidate and then it came out as I was finishing my PhD and that got me a book contract with Routledge to do textual poachers. Uh, but that piece is like one of the second or third articles I ever published as an academic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm always shocked when people quote it today as if they're citing some great authority, you know, as if the words were printed in red ink. And I'm going, I, you do have no idea how insecure and insignificant I felt at the time I was writing that piece and how much it changed the whole trajectory of my career, because I was going to be a film historian and much of my work has been growing out of that work on fandom. It, it, it's it's funny though because I, I I really appreciate sort of like you know the first articles and papers we write also for, for, for courses as graduate students so like you, part of part of you of course we have no idea what we're doing yet and 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 we're not really at the, you know, we were citing people that that we're still looking up to um, um, which is a healthy behavior in general of course but but there's also something about early papers by academics that I always find really exciting because often they or we, if I may say, write about, especially in the beginning, about things that we're truly passionate about. Like the things that only later on become codified or solidified in programmatic fields of study or, or things that acquire grants and, and teams and stuff like that. But early on, especially, it's, it's stuff that we love and uh, or that we think about when we think about ourselves and our own role. And that really comes through in, in that, that paper, uh, I think, and that this sort of genuine, uh, both fun as we talked about and, 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 and how much fun you can have, but also a respect for that, you know, when people use media, they, they do stuff and that stuff is, is, actually you called it stuff at many occasions, right? Uh, uh, really warrants uh, our attention and, and to some extent maybe even even celebration. I, I mean, if we want people to do something with media today, then then at least we have to acknowledge what they're already doing, I would say. No, I think that's, I think that's foundational. Uh, I'm mean, one of the early writings that I go back to a lot is Raymond Williams' 1958 Culture is Ordinary essay, right? Mm -hmm. Which is in some ways the foundation for cultural studies. Uh, and it's full of his story of traveling from his home, rural home to the Oxbridgean world, to the harassment he felt at the tea shop, to his anger at his teachers and his insistence that what they're teaching had nothing to do with the reality that he'd grown up with and experienced. Right. And I remember getting hit with that and from one of John Fisk's seminars and just, it spoke to me as a Georgian who was now you know, at the center of uh, media studies in the United States at that time, just spoke to me about that journey and, mm -hmm. the, and the connection. And as it happens, Fisk was himself a direct student of Raymond Williams. So I always say Raymond Williams was my intellectual grandfather. Right. But that essay is making the point that everyday people have culture, that culture is ordinary. It's things we do on an everyday basis. And so when I was writing about fans, I was describing the world I'd grown up in, the culture that I knew, like he knew rural Britain, you know, the culture that, that was everyday and familiar and ordinary for me, and yet seemed so alien to the teachers. And I was writing out of a sense of anger toward a field that was pretentious and dismissive 
of those everyday things that I knew so well. And like Raymond Williams, I saw myself is sort of waving my paper at this the educational establishment and saying, your theories don't account for my experience, right? right. And, I, and I encourage my students today to do that, right? Mm. That people are coming to our universities from all kinds of backgrounds all over the world. And that we're encountering so many first generation graduate students whose upbringing is at odds with what they're being taught. And they need to know to trust the grain of their own experience and to be able to fight back angrily at the things that we're teaching them that are wrong and that don't express the different epistemologies and cultural practices that reflect where they come from. And so to my politics around diversity and inclusion today is deeply informed by that essay by Raymond Williams and by my own experience of writing as a fan at a time when that was just not a thing that was done. Now, in fairness, textual culture, textual poachers comes out the same year as Camille Bacon Smith's Enterprising Women and as Constance Penley's work on, uh, on Slash and uh, Lisa Lewis's The Adoring Audience, all of which together make that a turning point from audience studies more broadly defined in the British tradition to a particular American tradition of thinking about fandom and fandom studies that is now become a global tradition. Yeah. And 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 yeah, you've mentioned it in, in, in your comment just now as well. I mean, a lot of this evolves around not the word use of the words consumption or reception or audience, but on practice and practices and what, what people are doing. And in a way, I mean, when you started writing about participatory culture, as as did some of your 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 uh, people, your colleagues at the time. Um, you were writing about a set of practices. Um, you called it cultural bricolage in, in, in that 1988 paper that I keep coming back to. Um, well before the World Wide Web, well before smart technologies and social media, right? How people uh, were sort of assembling, appropriating, remixing, redistributing, uh, reflecting on, dismantling, copying, pasting. I mean, all the stuff that we're all doing right now uh, um, was very much at the heart of, of, of these descriptions and these concerns at the time. And in order to give that meaning, you made a comment at the time that this clearly, all of this behavior, this cultural bricolage, clearly marks the end of imposed meanings. Now, fast forward to today, and we live at a time where experts and pundits and politicians and a lot of academics and educators are hand wringing and about the loss of trust in, in the truth, in elites, in, in experts, in, in, in disinformation and misinformation, in, in, in how people sort of don't buy into any kind of consensus uh, anymore and, and that we should do something uh, about this. And, and, I wonder how would you reflect, uh, based on your work, of course, on participatory culture, on, on, on this contemporary debate? And, and I specifically reference this because you've made comments about this in the past and tied this into not just a notion of media literacy, which is sort of a term that everybody is now embracing and all of a sudden, like Sonia Livingston says, a panacea for all problems, but a very specific version of media literacy that I think includes for you some of the elements in fan culture that you've seen all along, like, like informal mentorship and, and, and um, mutual support, uh, um, care, uh, recognition, uh, and, and, and those kind of elements, elements we don't often associate with formal media literacies. Yeah, oh, there's a lot to unpack in that question, so let me... Let me figure out where to start there. I mean, I, I think first of all, I would make the point that that I that when I was making those claims, my goal was not to destroy expertise, but to expand expertise, to mm -hmm. recognize that there are many forms of expertise and that the monopoly on expertise was not held by the academy. That academy had things to learn from other sectors that that fans had a different kind of expertise than producers, which is simply to build on what Stuart Hall talked about in Encoding, Decoding, where he talked about the different knowledge base the audience had when they received a text versus what was coded into it. So it was, but I, you know, so I think that's 
I was trying to expand who had access to the microphone, not and did not anticipate the moment we're at right now when there's so many people speaking, we can't hear any of them, you know, and we need the focus on listening and ethical listening that, um, you know, Nicholas Caldry has written about in some of his recent work, right? That that, that work is, you know, really important. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, I, you know, I think I assumed that as we formed participatory culture communities, that there would be an ethical debate about what was good and valuable participation and what was destructive participation. I saw that happening in fandom at the time, as my view slid from thinking about fandom to thinking about the web more generally. The web at the time was still largely subcultural, still full of niches of people from diverse background. It was not so broadly popular that the boundaries between them were collapsing, that as these subcultural communities were assembling more people than they could assimilate into their cultural norms and values. And so we've dramatically expanded who has access to the means of cultural production and circulation without developing shared ethical norms and helping those people develop them and losing the professional norms that had guided mainstream media production through most of its history. However ideologically constrained those norms were, there was a sense of what journalistic ethics was at that point. And I'm not sure we have a shared sense of journalistic ethics today any more than we have a shared sense of what is normative behavior online for everyday people. So that's, I think, how we got into the current moment where statements of truth are all subjective, right? And there was a time when objective claims to truth were seen as an ideological mask. Now subjectivity becomes something that we see as an excuse for ideological manipulation. And I think that's a deep problem at the current time. So I struggle day by day with the consequences of rapidly expanding participation without shared norms and ethics. Uh, I think media literacy has to be more than just critical consumption skills in that context, right? It, you know, I think if I trace the evolution of media literacy, it would be from a critical mode of consumption to a critical mode of production to now what I advocate is a critical mode of participation that includes this ethical dimension that I'm talking about. That it, you know, that it is about communicating and thinking of responsibly and being accountable to yourself and others for what you put into movement through the web. Being accurate and attentive to accuracy in the information you transmit. Being civil in the, in the way you communicate with other people finding ways to build up a community so that everyone has the chance to participate rather than narrowing it down and excluding and marginalizing and belittling other people. That's to me at the essence of what a participatory model of media literacy might look like. Now, is that model a panacea for everything wrong with our culture? Absolutely not, right? It is one tool. But from the very beginning, I said that the battles of the 21st century would be struggles over the terms of our participation, right? And I write about that in Convergence Culture and pretty much everything I've written about since. And by struggles over the terms of our participation, I mean legal policies, governmental policies, economic policies, inequalities, systemic racism, sexism, homophobia all of the things that narrow who gets to participate on what terms and how their voices are being heard and how their ideas are being transmitted. And that means we don't get rid of the critical studies concerns with media concentration, but we layer onto them an awareness of what other models might look like, right? And I know I'm going on long here, but the last thing I would say along that lines is, you know, I often get accused of undue optimism I think that's to misunderstand the role I see myself playing in the critical debates about media, right? Mm -hmm. First of all, I always see myself as counterbalancing a very critical strand in media studies, which tends to suck up all the oxygen and collapse people's ability to think outside of current conditions. And secondly, I see critique as one phase of a cycle 
that brings about social change. So for me, you have to begin by describing and analyzing the current conditions. Then you need a critique that explains the problems and how they arose. Then you need alternatives and advocacy for those alternatives, alternatives that look like they might go someplace, alternatives that we see in practice through a case study based methodology. And finally, there's intervention where academics partner with other segments of the society to bring about actual change on the ground. If we remain stuck in critique, we lack the ability to complete that cycle. You know, if you only critique, then you can't talk truth to power because you ain't talking to power. If you only critique, you're not identifying what you're for, only what you're against, and you're not moving toward the intervention that's gonna bring about change in those conditions. So for me, one of the reasons I like media literacy is because it's an intervention. It chooses a path, works with teachers in classrooms to bring about change on the ground in response to the issues we care about. And one of the reasons I'm seeing it as an optimist is because I'm an advocate who's identifying alternative practices that look like they might go someplace and might be the model for intervention and publicizing those through my work rather than pointing to the same problems that other people in our field have already identified. And if we all stand there in a circle and just say media concentration over and over again all, all the time and do nothing about it, then I don't think we're gonna solve the problems that we're identifying. Right. Yeah, th th that optimism notion, maybe it's not the, the, the right term. I mean, I guess you can make the same argument if you just like, unequivocally embrace an optimist perspective you're equally not uh contributing to that to that process that you that you're that you're uh, describing there um I, I would say though though that your perspective throughout your career on the role of media has then perhaps isn't optimistic but it has sort of a positive like an interesting bent of both sort of a positive perspective coupled with a sense of responsibility like you said responsibility to act upon what you see is going right or wrong and and try to do something about it um i mean because i mean we care about participatory culture because we assume that media play a powerful role in yes. everything right and 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 but but rather than embracing a notion of media effects you have always argued well it, it, it it's perhaps better to talk about or more interesting more more productive to talk about how people are using media and all kinds of different ways to to make it work in media and and rather than media doing all kinds of things to them or to us yeah. uh, for that matter and 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 what i really appreciate about this perspective is is, is how you've always seem to feel and, and highlight in your work, especially because so much of your work is about describing inspiring cases and, and examples, historically as well as contemporary, um, of, of where people are capable when they get adequate support and mentorship and, 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 and trust to really make a difference. And, and that's just not just in the academic work, but also personally, like for example, uh, you and your wife Cynthia's role as housemasters at a, at a dorm at, at, at MIT for I think 14 or 16 years, um, and 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 you, not so long ago you published on your blog some of your fond memories of that time of of, of taking on this 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 role for all these young people who were in that dorm at the time were often considered sort of a bit weird or perhaps even a problem because they were a bit more flamboyant than perhaps the rest of the university was at the time. So, so I guess, sorry for the long introduction, but where do you feel that perspective in you comes from, that, that combination of, of really wanting to, to, to identify with and stand up for those one way or another, you know, sidelined or, you know, like Trekkies or, or, or these, these, dorm, these kids in this dorm uh, um, or, or all the scholars from all over the world that you bring along for the ride with you on your blog, in your publications and in your work coupled with this sense of responsibility. I mean, it's like optimism plus responsibility is such a fundamental part of who you are, how you, how you come across. Where does that come from? Well, I think I'd start with my parents and the world that I grew up with here in Atlanta. Uh, my father was one of three or four generations of deacons in the Baptist church. My mother ran vacation Bible school, was the den mother of our local Cub Scouts. 
performed as a clown at uh, charity events. There was a sense in our household of, if you had the capacity to help someone else, you had an obligation to do so. Mm. Now they weren't thinking on the scale of the modern digital world where anyone in the world can ask for help and I struggle to find ways to help them, right? That, that was a local community vision of what it was, but they were very committed to this idea of you grow yourself through public service. And this was not at all a noblesse oblige idea. This was the poor helping each other through difficult times because neither of them came from families that had money and they were, we were barely middle class when I was growing up, but there was a sense that public service was the way the community grew and survived difficult times. And that really shaped me in a profound way. So that gets the service side. The, the outsider stuff starts somewhere between seventh and eighth grade. I, I was very popular because my mother was popular in seventh grade as people developed adolescent autonomy. I woke up one day and found myself a social pariah and outcast, right? And I was being made fun of you know, I've experienced a lot of gay, gay insults and gay bashing in, in high school. Homophobia was the way that traditional Southern masculinity polices itself. And I wasn't going to the hunting grounds or the football games or didn't fit a traditional notion of masculinity. My interests were geeky before being geek was at all fashionable. And I wore a black trench coat to school and felt very much alone through most of my high school careers. Now, I don't want to overstate that because I was captain of the debate team, editor of the school newspaper, star of the school plays, but I was doing all of the geeky things, individualistic things, and very little else. And that's left, that combination of things, the powerful influence of my mother in particular, and the, the uh, sense of outsiderhood and being insulted and bashed in school, physically beaten up in school, has always led me to side with underdogs, with groups that were fighting for dignity, respect, that were trying to express a different viewpoint on the culture. Mm -hmm. Now, for some academics, that would have translated into being celebratory of the avant-garde, the mm -hmm. high art side. Mine's a pop art side, so I like low art. I like the people who are drawn to important conversations through popular culture. I listen to those voices and I learn from them. Right. So the time we spent in the dorm was a period where I had to defend a community that I cared about constantly against pressure from the university administration, but also where I learned so much about contemporary youth culture and particularly about how you forge a community of outsiders with different backgrounds, how difference works together to achieve something that protects everyone's interest, because this was such a vital, self-supporting, nourishing community. Mm -hmm. Not seen that way by the out people outside that dorm, but anyone who lived in that space saw the role of tradition, of connection, of caring, self-care and mutual self-care, all part of that culture. And so much of what I've written about since I left MIT is still infused with those observations, walking the hallways of that dorm late at night and interacting with students who had been seen as different all their life, and yet were succeeding in getting into MIT and doing incredible things at MIT, who were the cornerstone of the arts at MIT in particular. That world was one that was worth protecting and nurturing for the 14 years we were there. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for, sh for sharing that. And, and it also speaks to something that is truly remarkable. <laughs> As many things are about about your career and about your work is is not just that support for people and and for people who come to ask you for help, uh, uh, but you, also your ability to truly, oh, to use your own terms, to be able to geek out with 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 anybody, right? I mean, I mean, like you you are one of the few people in our field who has the ear both of, 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 of students and colleagues, yes, but also of people in the various media industries whose work you touch, like whether it's comics or, or movies or games or, or, and so on and so forth, um, as well as audiences, fans, obviously. Um, and uh, so, so it's it's this 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 now, now now of course I could ask you like how do you do that right how how do you get to speak with all these different groups and communities and 
And and I guess I mean your answer to some extent would be well you know just I'm just you would be genuine you have to just be genuinely interested in what everybody brings to the table what everybody's got to say, and and um, and, and while that is incredibly valuable and and and, and beautiful, there is a, a concern or a debate uh, in 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 our scholarly field about the rest of the world not seeming to care about us or not wanting to listen to us, especially in these times where concerns about the media run, are paramount, whether they are you know, debates in political circles or, or in online communities or just in the street or whatever, everybody's talking about the media as a source of concern. And so you would now think like, you know, people would turn to us, but they generally don't. How would you look at that particular uh, issue, especially from your perspective of, of having the ear of so many different communities? Well, I mean, first of all, I think these boundaries are self-policing on both sides, right? There is a strong strand of anti-intellectualism that runs through American culture. And I don't always experience that when I go to other places around the world. I'm getting ready for a Zoom talk in a couple of weeks in Brazil. And I'm getting interviewed by multiple news source, newspapers in Brazil about my impending virtual visit, which suggests the hunger for intellectual life in some parts of the world compared to the you know, disdain in America for a lot of intellectual work. Mm. So to get into that, those dialogues, you've got to break down those barriers, right? And, and we have to actively work at it. It's not like they're going to come knocking at our door and, pro and say, please, please tell us your wisdom from on high. Uh -huh. But rather, you know, we have to actually say, look, here's some interesting ideas. I want to know more about what you're doing. I'd love to hear what's happening in your space. And once you do that, and once you do so in a way that's accessible, and I, by accessible, I mean language, but I also mean socially accessible, friendly, open-minded. Once we do that, then I get emails every day from people all over the world and all kinds of media, from fans to educators to policymakers to creative leaders asking for insight or asking to meet with me. And I can't, have, I can't make all the meetings happen that come through the door because of that. Mm. So... This is a skill, this is involves a set of skills that I take very seriously. And so I'm just finishing up teaching a course at USC that is maybe the fourth or fifth time I've taught it for our PhD students to think about public facing dimensions of their professional lives. And it's a mixture of guest talks by people both in USC and elsewhere who are doing what's broadly defined as public intellectual work, coupled with how to lessons on how to blog, how to do interviews, how to write op-eds, how to write policy statements. We've just I'm just finishing up grading dialogic essays, which is a form that I have, I believe in very firmly, mm -hmm. where scholars of different backgrounds engage with conversations with each other. And it invariably brings out a more personal dimension. It forces them to write in a more accessible way it shows their engagement with the world. They start to out themselves as fans and citizens when they write in this mode. The ways we write are structured to get into peer-reviewed academic journals. The narrower the journal, the better, because we talk about high impact factor journals, which is you know, Orwellian to me, right. that phrase, because they're anything but, right? These are the journals that are most specialized most narrowly defined, and we all surf on the journal's reputation rather than the impact of our own writing. Right. So I've had much of my impact without almost never publishing in high-end impact academic journal. Most of my journal's publications are in position journals that aren't even peer-reviewed. Most of my academic writing is book chapters or books. And I've done a lot of journalistic work to try to get those ideas out. And I'm trying to push my students to write in that mode, which has a personality, has a vernacular, has a way of engaging with people and signals approachability from a general public that is desperately dealing with media change every day and seeking answers and just doesn't know that we're willing to even talk to them. 
Well, th this speaks to to something else about about your work, and then you've mentioned this now a couple of times. It, it, and, <laughs> I mean, if, if 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 you look at your blog at at, at the line underneath, like uh, who the you know hell is, is yeah, yeah. Jenkins, you immediately introduce yourself. Well, I'm prolific as hell. And and it is truly remarkable. I mean, obviously you you do do you have your scholarly work and your 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 range of books. Uh, you're very loyal to your publisher, to NYU Press, and and then you of course have this blog that has been running for for such a long time since 2006. You've a couple of years ago you started a podcast with your colleagues at USC. Uh, How do you like it so far? Um, uh, which has already over eight, 70 episodes uh, uh, at the moment. Um, you manage multiple social media accounts. I mean, obviously, you you constantly on the road for talks and now on the virtual road. Um, and and, and I, I've come to know you as somebody who says yes, perhaps more than is good <laughs> for you. Yes. It's always amazing, uh, including uh, our meeting today. Um, it, it, I mean, it seems to me that you're like the course that you teach on 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 on, on how to be a public intellectual. Come, you, your your work seems to embody what Silvio Weisbord in his most recent book, The Communication Manifesto, calls the the um, a, a form of public scholarship, right? Where he says, like, you know, we have so much to say, we should say it in, in you know by any means necessary, which is a riff on one of your book titles. Um, and 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 th th there might be a tension between what we get credit for in our institutions, uh, like you said, you know, publish in high impact journals and then you'll be fine. But there is a responsibility that we have to reach out that way. But it's also, and, and I find this really encouraging. I mean, it's also a lot of fun. I mean, I, I see it in, in in a new generation of scholars who express themselves through through poetry and through other forms of art performance. Um, I mean, and what what would you say to somebody who's starting out in this in this world? I mean, uh, how to take those first steps? Well, I, my usual advice is to give unto Caesar, which is to say, the way you can do it all is to become overproductive, right? right? Which is horrible advice to give anyone because this is saying, why don't you go become a workaholic and then see how happy your life turns out? But I think if you give the institution what it needs to give you tenure, mm -hmm. and you maintain good social relations inside that institution, that buys you the freedom to experiment and do a variety of different things. Mm -hmm. So I think I am able to do all of this other more experimental work and engage with other publics because I am prolific as hell, because I write quickly, and that grows out of having journalistic training. Right. And so I can knock prose out and I'm constant, the conversations I'm constantly involved with, with all kinds of people, informs my thinking. So there's no shortage of ideas percolating through my mind. And, it, and to some degree, much of my work is what uh, Bruce Sterling would call pattern recognition, right? I'm identifying patterns and configurations in the world and putting them down as clearly as I can and as a service to our field and to other groups out there and then pushing them out maintaining a strong social media presence so those ideas can be heard. Right. So there's not, you know, you know, that's a kind of core principle of mine is you can't do it if you're not in a stable position at your university. Mm -hmm. Now I'm cynical about a lot of what universities think is important in terms of tenure. I don't think that's the right path for the field. I think we've got to keep pushing the challenge a lot of the norms of what we do in tenure, which has become more quantitative and less deliberative with every passing year. And so I think it's very important to keep, for those of us who have seniority, to keep pushing back. Right. But we want to encourage our students to maintain their soul as they go through that process. And for many of them, that involves speaking to and representing communities they come from whether that's participation in the Black Lives Matter movement or the Occupy movement or environmental justice, their political soul is important to them. Their cultural soul is important to them. Their obligations to groups beyond the academy is important. And we, I never want to discourage anyone from pursuing that, going back to what I said about Raymond Williams early on, 
that field emerged from those energies and therefore we want to have those energies pushing us toward the future. I want those students challenging me in the classroom every day that I'm there so I learn as much as I teach. So if I'm giving advice, it is to be fearless that doing work that replicates what everyone is already doing is a path to mediocrity and won't get you tenure anyway, mm. right? That going out and being participating in blogs and podcasts may well give you visibility in the field, which makes it more likely that a senior scholar will say it's worth my time to review this case and write a letter. And that's apt to contribute to you getting tenure almost as much as getting a publication in a top tier journal. So I think this sense of advice that that stuff doesn't count is misleading. It counts in a different way in the tenure process. But what gets me to read a book manuscript that I'm being asked to review or a tenure case or whatever is that I care something about what this person is doing. And that's either because they're doing something people haven't done before that's non-conventional in that sense, or it's because I know them because they're a voice in the world that I see making a difference and I wanna be there to support those people when yeah. the letter comes. Right. And so I think it's wrong to tell people it doesn't count for tenure. It just counts differently than the easy quantification of X number of peer review journals with X number of citational references versus looking more deeply at the impact someone's career has had on the world. It's very much also related to, to what I'm also hearing you saying in a way is, is, is to like you, I love how you mentioned uh, that you, it's also about your soul, right? As, 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 as a scholar, as, as a grad student or as an accomplished professor, it's very much that you speak truth to what you uh, believe in and what you're passionate about. Um, I, I, I want to double back to two major works of yours. Um, um, Convergence Culture, and then after that, the Civic Imagination Project. Um, but first, Convergence Culture, which was very much at the time sort of a culmination of a lot of the work that you've done before with a perhaps more direct and deliberate engagement with the industry. Um, I mean, I, I guess to some extent, it was a book also written for the industry uh, to, to show them the way forward, right? Uh, and, and perhaps le less aimed at at, at, at the, the, our academic field and, and more towards really trying to sort of summarize developments that you felt were really important and pushing forward. And um, I, I do remember at the time, it came out in 2006 and, and, and after that, I had the privilege of, of guest editing a special issue of a journal, Convergence on your, on your book. And um, um, I, I, I have been thinking about if if let's just say in a couple of years um, you'd consider a, a 20th anniversary edition of Convergence Culture like you've done for Textual Poachers, what additional chapter would you write? Would, would that be one where you address whatever critiques were, 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 were leveled at you at the time or would you take what you signaled at that time into a, a, a new direction? Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but, but mm. what would that look like? Why? Uh let me work up to that. Uh, you know, let's say a little bit about the writing of Convergence Culture. I was, I, and interestingly, I wrote Convergence Culture living in a cabin by myself in the North Georgia mountains with dial up computer and my nearest neighbor was like a mile away. Uh, uh, and I did most of the research online at an incredibly slow download rate of information. Uh, and yet somehow it worked. Uh, I wrote it with the goal, I was, we were in the process of creating the comparative media studies program at MIT. My obligation was to raise money to support about 20 master's students a year, stipend and tuition. I needed to raise funds and there was a strong MIT tradition of books that laid out larger visions for the future, something like Nicholas Negroponte's Being Digital. Uh, so that was what I set out to write in that book. I tried to make it a popular book because I thought that would help, but I couldn't reduce it to three big ideas, which is what I kept being told by agents uh, that I needed to, to do if I was going to um, produce, produce that kind of book. So it ended up being an academic press book, but it ended up being read by more people outside of academia than inside it, if that's 
possible, certainly in the early days. And we heard stories of companies buying copies for all of their employees, that it was a conversation that was spreading through the business world. And so that created doors for me to raise money for my students, but also to have a platform to speak inside the companies. And I never felt more political than when I was standing in a corporate boardroom advocating for citizens and fans and other groups because they were actually a place where people in power to act could hear me. And I was helping empower the next generation of leaders there who were resisting old thinking inside those, those companies. So that process was there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to some degree the critique, the idea that I wasn't critical of the corporations doesn't understand that context, first of all. Right. right that I'm, I have an obligation to my students to raise money to some degree, those corporations wanted me to bite their hands and say things that they wouldn't have heard otherwise. To some degree, I come at those problems indirectly so that they can be heard. But I didn't ever envision how much of an impact that book would have on the corporate world, only that it would be a calling card, not that it would precede me and have people pounding on the door wanting to work with me in that, that space. And that really changed things. But I also didn't, the word Web 2.0 doesn't appear anywhere and convergence culture. Even that concept was taking place somewhere else as I was writing that book in my cabin in the North Georgia mountains, let alone the critiques that would emerge of Web 2.0. So the, it's written in a moment of optimism where both corporations and to some degree the academy believed dramatic change was possible. Yeah. By the time the book is out, uh, for a few years, cultural studies does a special journal issue, uh, you know, rethinking convergence culture, which was kind of a hostile rethinking of convergence culture. And I was able to write a pretty detailed response to many of those critiques, which is still the best statement I've been able to make about some of the critical studies critique of that, that work. So if I were to rewrite it today, the interesting thing is almost all of the franchises I wrote about in convergence culture are still thriving, including the matrix going back into production, the current moment. So, and you know, and the fragmentation of media sense means that it'd be, it'd be hard to find examples that worked as widely for as many people as the examples I used in that book did. But you could update each of those examples and think about what's happened, say, to Harry Potter fandom and how J.K. Rowling's anti-trans perspective has led to pushback against the author at the center of that franchise. And yet, the franchise survives after that, or now Johnny Depp being bumped from the lead role in the fa fabulous creatures movies, right? So that there's, there's something still dynamic in which that text remains central to political debates around race, gender, sexuality, uh, social justice at the current time. And I think it could be an interesting opening into some of the questions of how we're using popular culture today to think about political issues and how that shaped the generation of young activists in the streets today. You know, probably today if I was to, but so yes, I would take up that corporate critique. We did do a piece criticizing Web 2.0 and Spreadable Media, the book that I did with Sam Ford and Joshua Green. I had that book manuscript read by Sarah Bene Weiser, who was definitely critical studies person who participated in that special issue and responded to her critiques page by page, paragraph by paragraph to make that a stronger statement and one that is more critical. And I've become progressively more critical, certainly in the age of Trump, one has to be critical. Yeah. But I still hold on to the position I said earlier that I wanna be an advocate for viable alternatives rather than a critic of the status quo. And I think you have to have some criticism to do advocacy. It's a foundation for advocacy, but I think advocacy pushes beyond it and answers questions that critical writing so far doesn't answer for me. Yeah, yeah I'm always uh, really inspired and, and by, um, uh, and you've written about games as well. And, and, and I always think like if, if any example in, in a new edition would come out, it, would, it could, could very well be about the games world because I mean, when I visit game studios, uh, like Guerrilla Games, which is based in Amsterdam, the makers of the Horizon Zero Dawn uh, game series with a main character as a female lead, uh, and it's a stunning game environment. 
and and the people in the studio there like the way they address their community i mean the whole and you see this in, often in game studios right where 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 their, their primary place of work is scattered with fan art everywhere right and which is celebrated and, and embraced and there's 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 such an investment in their in their gaming and modding communities which I always uh, hold up as a standard to when I talk to journalists or to people in other media industries. It's like, well, you know, if you come to me with questions about how to deal with your audience, check what the game industry is doing, right? What, what these studios are doing. That's, that's definitely something uh, that I always find really uh, in, inspiring. And how, how do you look at the game? In, because the game industry right now is very much... Uh, something the world is looking at with the introduction of the new PlayStation and Xbox. I mean, um, how, how do you look at, at, at that industry at the moment and how, how it's dealing? I know it's a bit of a sidebar, no. but I'm just fascinated. Well, I would say less and less because coming to USC, which has a strong games division, my focus on games has been less needed than it was at MIT where I was raising money and all, you know, overseeing multiple research units that involved with games. So I'm very interested in this question. Certain students bring things to me about it, but it has not been the central focus of mine since I left MIT. I okay. think it's that work would be breakthrough, but it's someone else's to write, I think, at this point. The gaps are too big in my <laughs> knowledge for me to go back and reclaim that strand of my research. And to some degree, the work I was doing on games has led to, has shifted to work on comics, which is something that I've loved since childhood. and and, and am much more interested in that medium right now, especially because comics are another industry that is more highly responsive to its audience and fan base that is cheapest, the cheapest medium to produce in many ways and the more allowing rapid response to social trends and is functioning as the research and development wing of uh, the major media companies. So we want to see where mass media is going. You start with, fan, with comics and games and look at the trends there and see what the consequences are. And there are enough people paying attention to games. I'm right now focused on comics. Yeah, yeah actually for, for, for anybody who's, who's watching, uh, I would in this context strongly recommend the episode in your podcast series, uh, How Do You Like It So Far, where you talk with Scott McCloud, the author of yeah. Understanding Comments. It's one of my favorite episodes. He's also one of my favorite authors, but it's it's such an amazing episode and such a great conversation that you two have there. Well, Scott and I have known each other since the beginning of both of our careers, so we're very comfortable with each other, and I think we got some really interesting stuff out of him. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, Henry, um, in conclusion, because um, I don't want to colonize your time too much, I would love to talk a little bit more about the Civic Imagination Project. It's a project I think sure. has been running now for about six years at USC. Um, I mean, because it, it, it seems to be bringing together like bits and pieces from, from all aspects of your career. Obviously, your concerns and work on participatory culture, your engagement with the worlds of education and teaching and training. Um, um, your excitement about amateur and, and fan-based media production, or let's say just everyday media production that people are doing often without realizing it. Um, activism, democratic engagement, it, it, it all sort of comes, comes together in, in this project. Um, and for people who, who don't know much about it yet, um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the project? I mean, of course, a book with case studies from this project just came out. Um, um, and, and how do you see this project or how would you love to see this project then move forward? Well, maybe we'll start with the concept of civic and then the relationship of the imagination to the civic. Mm. So for me, civic is that set of shared understandings between members of a community, which makes it possible to conduct everyday life and at the same time engage in politics, disagree with each other, and still preserve that sense of community. And we can taste that all the way back to the dorm I was talking about earlier, where people certainly disagreed intensely on the many issues in the life of the dorm, but they, there was a shared commitment to the dorm itself that allowed them to come back together. So that is the, the political realm, particularly electoral politics, as a force that's continually dividing us, that wears out the civic, and that needs, we need healing and restoration at the end of each political cycle. And that's the last thing we're seeing in the United States. 
right. the, the divides get deeper, the distrust gets deeper, family members start out a conversation shouting at each other because they're carrying old disagreements with them. We don't know our neighbors or we look at them hostily because they have the signs in the yard for the wrong candidate. All of that is destructive to what I'm calling the civic. Mm -hmm. So for the civic to function well, there needs to be a strong element of the imagination in the ways we think about social change. So first of all, before you can build a better world, you, or, or you have to imagine what a better world looks like. And that ought to be fundamental. And it goes back to my critique of critique versus advocacy. Advocacy gives us a way of thinking and imagining what a better world looks like. It should build on critique, but it can't stay at critique if it's going to grow. So secondly, you need to imagine yourself as a civic being, a civic agent capable of making change. And here we bring to the table all this idea about agency that has run through cultural studies for so many decades. Third, you have to be part, ima imagine yourself as part of a community with shared interests. And we can use Benedict Anderson's concept of the imagined community, or we can use what I prefer, the imagining community, which is to say it's a participatory process of collective imagining that enables the community to come into being, not a static product of a pre-existing colonial imagination, but something that changes rapidly. You have to have a shared sense of, uh, you have to have a model of social change, right? And imagine what that might look like. You know, and that comes out of the literature on participatory politics and some of the writings like people like Ethan Zuckerman, who talks about very different models and levers of social change. We have to um, imagine solidarity with communities whose backgrounds and perspectives are different from our own. And that's what makes it civic imagination and not simply a political imagination is we're trying to bring difference into it and bring it with us and preserve ties with people we fundamentally disagree with. And finally, from the radical black imagination literature and particularly Freedom Dreams, Robin Kelly's book, we take this idea that before you, you have to imagine if you're an oppressed or marginalized people, you have to imagine freedom, democracy, respect, dignity, participation before you've directly experienced it. Mm -hmm. And the Georgian in me looks for inspiration to John Lewis and registering people to vote in Selma, Alabama, black people who'd never been able to see any direct benefit of voting, who are risking their lives to do so, and yet inspiring them to make change that has led to new political configurations like what we've seen in Georgia in the past US presidential election, right? And that process of civic change is very, very real and material when we look at it. So that's what we mean by the civic imagination. There are two dimensions of the work that we do. One is documenting the existing civic uh, imagination work that's going on on new activist groups, right? So we see people call it narrative change or pop culture change. It is a fan activism, cultural acupuncture. All of these words refer to models that are emerging organically from activist groups, from foundations, from policy think tanks about how we build a better world. It's what we're seeing with Afrofuturism. We're seeing environmental futurism. We're seeing the imagination play a vital role in these movements. And so we're trying to capture that, document that. And the book, Popular Culture and the Civic Imagination, is close to 30 case studies of diverse movements around the world. And it barely scratches the surface because we've seen this summer, uh, we've seen this summer K-pop fans become central to social movements uh, here in the US. We're seeing Hong Kong students march through the streets singing the song from Les Mis, Can You Hear the People Singing as a national anthem for democratic and for this anticipation. We're seeing this everywhere. Right. The other side is we're doing intervention, which is to go out into communities here in the US, red states, blue states, around the world, and engage with communities in world building and workshops and drawing people together to think for extended period of time collectively about what kind of future world they want to live in and how they're going to get there and what the shared values of that community is. And that's the basis for another book which just came out, Practicing the Future which is a guide for activists and educators, describes our workshops, this has case studies of specific communities and what's happened there as a result of the workshops. 
So that's the next phase. And now for us, the final phase, I don't know final, but the next phase is to work with creative industries to bring those civic imaginations of diverse people together and inform the next stage of media production. If pop culture is the resource we use to think about the future together, then we wanna have a cycle which brings grassroots thinking about the future back in to help shape and inform the work of everything from small scale independent comics producers to major media blockbusters. And the doors are opening up for that work right now, on part based on the industry work I've done before, they'll listen to me. And they're, we're hearing uh, discussions about how to bring the civic in at this moment where they're all scared to death of Black Lives Matter and the protest and they're thinking more deeply about inclusion and diversity than ever before. How to reflect a more pluralistic vision for the future of America through popular culture is part of the next phase of the work that we're just beginning to do. Well, it certainly seems that that from a distance, and I say this from a distance, obviously, that that, but also as somebody who's lived in the US for 10 years, that 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 one of the few things that can actually start a, a common conversation in the US is popular culture, right? I mean, through yeah. popular culture, people get because you know, we're all fan of a certain franchise or a certain title or whatever, regardless, like you said, of red state, blue state backgrounds. And then, then to 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 provide tools to help people imagine jointly a better world seems uh, seems a fruitful endeavor. And, and 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 the project also works specifically not just with communities but also with schools, right? Yes. So we're doing work. We, we've done work in schools. Uh, the early work was in Freedom Schools for Dreamers and schools at mosques. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're helping teachers bring this into their classrooms. We've worked with the National Writing Project. We just did a series of activities that parents who are homeschooling their kids during COVID can do building off their kids' relation to media and fostering some ideas about civic imagination in that way. Mm -hmm. So, and we have teachers just adapting our, our ideas and workshops and running with them in ways we never would have imagined. So that builds off the work I've done for decades now in new media literacies. And that's still very much part of the work that we're doing with the civic imagination project. But as you're, you're right that, you know, I wrote years ago that Americans watch uh, 24 in the blue states and West Wing in the red states, that <laughs> pop culture is what brings us together as a country and debates through popular culture may be the way to think our way out of some of the ideological divides that rock the U.S. politics at the current moment. Absolutely. Dolly Parton may save us all yet. Uh, she may, seems to be embody a particular purple vision for America. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah. It's interesting to see who comes out of the woodwork to inspire us, uh, inspire us next. Absolutely, um, Henry. Thank you so much for your time, uh, um, for for spending some time with us, uh, uh, um, and, and 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 wishing you and your wife and of course her mom all the best. Uh, and and um, and I hope very much. Uh, to catch you again in person soon, somewhere in the world, uh, um, possibly in LA or, or, or somewhere else. I, I hope we can do that and have pancakes along the canals in Amsterdam again sometime or something of the sort. Thank you so much for doing this.